So today we have an amazing workshop where we'll learn about Prometheus. And um, Vanessa, Jessica, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alexi. And also thank you for inviting us uh, to join the community um, and have this opportunity to share some of the stuff that we found truly awesome. Um, okay, just before I start sharing, I just wanted to check with you, Vanessa, if you wanted to share for the start bit, um, or do, would you prefer me to share the slides? We will have to switch back and forth, so folks will have to um, just bear with us while we do that. Um, I guess since my slide is one of the first ones, I can just go ahead and start sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so this will be very organic in the sense that um, we will be trading off sharing. Um, I actually just realized it makes more sense for you to share because of the single screen that I have. So please go ahead and start sharing and then you can just move on to my slide. Okay. You can do the opening. So. All right, Lexi, you could give us a thumbs up maybe just to confirm you see this slide. Awesome, okay. Yeah, thanks everyone again for um, joining or watching this replay if that's what you've chosen to do. Um, our workshop is, as Alexi mentioned, about Prometheus and observing Python applications, but it has another name, which is, we know what your app did last summer, do you? Uh, you can prepare to learn like a good uh, look into how to use Prometheus and how to instrument your Python applications, but you can also expect some fun movie references. Um, so yeah, let's dive straight in. Nice. So, hey everyone, um, really nice to e meet you, although, you know, I don't get to see all of your lovely faces. Um, so, yeah, firstly, Alexi, as Jessica said, thanks so much for having us. I'm really excited to be here, and I gave this um, workshop together with Jessica at PyCon DE this year, and that was a really great time, so I'm really happy to be able to give that again um, online and in a more accessible way for others to be able to participate. So, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Vanessa Aguilar and I am a Mexican-American based in Berlin typically. Um, however, now for the holidays I'm visiting my family. So that's where the time difference comes from. It's 8 a.m. where I am at the moment. Um, so I'm currently working as a site reliability engineer for Ecosia.org, um, who is a green search engine and uses their profits to plant trees. If you haven't already um, heard about them, I would definitely recommend you to check them out. Um, and I made the switch to SRE from being a front end engineer. Um, if you're interested in hearing about that journey, feel free to reach out to me and um, I can tell you more about that. Otherwise though, other important things about me is that I'm a dog mom. I have a really lovely um, pug who Jessica is the aunt to, um, or so we like to think. Um, otherwise, I really love uh, music. I'm an avid scrobbler, so if you know what that means, then yay, people who still use Last.fm. Um, I really like horror movies, which is where the inspiration for some of the, the presentation slides that you'll see today come from. And otherwise, last but not least, I really enjoy working with the community um, in this context, more specifically the tech community, and. Um, the work that I do places an emphasis on um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the tech industry. And over to you, Jess. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, my name's Jessica. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a software engineer at Ecosia uh, with Vanessa, as she mentioned. Um, I'm actually a self tour slash community tour engineer. So I career changed. Um, previously, I've worked at, as a coffee roaster, um, and before that, as a camera assistant. So you may have heard Alexi asking me about being a barista, um, and we had a really lovely conversation about that previously um, for this wonderful community. Um, other side, outside of work, I am active in the PyLady community. I really like organizing events and helping others to be able to share their knowledge via workshops and speaking. Um, I also love reading, knitting, and I'm very keen interest in sustainability and using tech for climate action, which is part of the work that I'm doing at Ecosia. So, 
So before we get into the bulk of the presentation, we really wanted to take a moment to highlight um, the fact that observability is really a team effort. Um, so for those of you who are maybe um, just getting into, you know, the trying to learn about observability and how you actually apply it both practically but also theoretically within your team, we really wanted to um, reiterate the fact that it is a team effort and it requires um, not only technical implementation but also um, really effort, personalized effort from people and individuals to communicate with each other. So as we mentioned, Jessica works as a software engineer with an emphasis in uh, backend at Ecosia, and I'm a site reliability engineer. And we really put a lot of effort into making sure that we break down silos that exist and we're always communicating as to how we can better improve the visibility and reliability of not only the services that we own, but just the services that our engineering organization owns in general. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really why we were excited to create this workshop together. Um, not only like our mutual respect for one another, but really like that synergy between uh, these different disciplines um, that we've both um, support each other growing within and like really emphasizing like communication and collaboration being at the core of that. So just to give like a more concrete example of um, what we're talking about here, um, we could look at, for example, like on-call rotations and incident management. And for example, we might think that in an ideal world, like every developer who's deploying code would also then be responsible for that service. Um, so when there's an incident happening, they would also be the person who would uh, be the first responder. Um, after all, they are going to have like the more insights into how that service or application was written and how the code is structured. But the thing is, that's not always possible. And like, for example, at Ecosia, we actually have a small subset team, which is made up of both SREs like Vanessa and software engineers like myself, who often have very little familiarity with the specific services um, that we are supposed to monitor and first respond to. So that really means that as an engineer who's deploying her code into production, I really need to ensure that others can also observe my service. And that more than that, they know when something is behaving unexpectedly. This in part is gonna be setting up like good monitoring, which we're gonna show you the basics of today, but it also goes much further than that. And that means like meaningful and non-noisy logs, setting up alerts, creating run books that describe how to handle the service during an instant. But really what it boils down to is what Vanessa mentioned, which is collaboration and communication. So we wanted to give you a preview, um, so an agenda so that you could mentally prepare yourselves for what you can expect. Um, we're gonna have a really good mix of like theory, but then also practical so that you are really able to um, get that practice today with us. And just one additional note there, in case folks didn't hear us talking about it at the start, is we have planned in points for questions. So if you have questions, please post them in the YouTube chat um, or where you're watching, and Alexi will uh, collect those and moderate them at the points that we've assigned for Q&A. OK, so first of all, let's orientate ourselves. What are we talking about? What is monitoring? Um, Give yourself a couple of seconds in your mind just to think what pops to your head. Um, and then I'm gonna explain to you from my perspective what it is and what we're talking about. So in engineering, monitoring is the practice of regularing, regularly observing and measuring the performance of a system or a process. And that's in order to ensure that it's operating as intended and to identify any potential issues or problems that may arise. So for production services, we're going to tend to monitor what we call the three pillars of observability, metrics, traces, and logs. If they're not things that you're yet familiar with, don't worry. We're going to focus predominantly on metrics, but they're things that you can learn about in other workshops, and there's plenty of material online. You might have also thought about things like dashboards, alerts, and paging systems, and these are all parts of things that make up the monitoring ecosystem.
So now that we've talked a little bit about what monitoring is, we want to talk about why it actually matters. So monitoring is important because it really helps us as engineers to confirm that our software is working as intended. Um, and conversely, it also helps us to have tangible proof with data um, to provide and communicate with stakeholders um, when it isn't working as expected. So this is at the core of why monitoring is important. Um, but additionally, uh, when, you know, when it's people that aren't like myself or Jessica who are owning a particular service, it's really useful for engineers that are interacting with these services um, to be able to quickly detect and diagnose problems and enable them to take corrective action to prevent or um, even mitigate negative effects um, on tangential systems or processes that are happening that exist. And if we know the what and we have the why, what about the how? So that's where a few of these tools that you may be familiar with come into play. For the purpose of reducing scope, we're actually gonna look solely at metrics for this workshop and how we can monitor them. Uh, metrics are statistics we collect from an application that indicate how our application is behaving. So there's various tools you can use to monitor your application and to extract these metrics, but we're gonna be using Prometheus as that's what we use at Ecosia and we're most familiar with it. Prometheus is an open source systems monitoring and alerting toolkit. Originally it was built at SoundCloud, uh, which some of you might be familiar with. And in our setup, Prometheus is gonna scrape the applications at regular intervals, which we've configured. So this means we first have to do what's called instrumenting. Instrumenting our applications means that we then expose metrics and this is going to be conventionally done uh, by adding the endpoint forward with slash metrics. This is all configurable, so technically it could be anything, but this is the convention that you'll see most commonly out there, and that's what we're going to use um, for this purpose. So once we've scraped, once uh, Prometheus, sorry, has scraped um, those metrics, or as I mentioned, statistics, we're then going to be storing them um, as time series data. And along with an optional key value pair, which is called labels, which we can later use to filter when we're querying our metrics. This time uh, series data means that we can then look back to see not only what happened, but also when. From there, we're going to be able to start building dashboards. And when this workshop, we're going to do that using a tool called Grafana. It's a powerful tool and it also lets us to do, lets, allows us to do many other things such as setting up alerts, run incident man uh, management schedules and page engineers responsible. Um, however, we are not going to dig that deep into it because we would certainly need more than 90 minutes, um, but we're going to just like cover really broadly um, how you can get going with this today in your own application. I do fully recommend though checking out the documentation for both of these tools. Um, because, you know, there's a lot more, like I say, that we're not going to cover. Um, and that documentation is good enough that you can, once you've got started, take it that step further. And also, you know, there's lots of other tools out there. These are the ones we're familiar with, the ones that bring us joy to work with, but by no means are we saying these are ultimately the absolute best. Okay, so... Um, first, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a small tour of the code that we're going to be looking at. So I think, Alexi, you already shared the GitHub link uh, in the chat. Yeah, it's in the chat and also in the description. If you're watching this in the recording, so probably you will not have access to chat. Just go to the description and you will see that. And I already cloned, uh, I already forked the repo and then I cloned the fork, right? This is what I should do with this. Um, I think this is the ideal way to work with other people's repositories, but you can uh, also clone it as is if you want. You just won't be able to uh, push it back up to GitHub. Perfect. And if you could just confirm for me that you now see the page for uh, GitHub and that the size is okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So if you've managed to navigate to this GitHub uh, repository, this is what you're going to see. And we're going to jump straight into the app directory. 
and we're going to look in the main.py. In this file, we're using Python standard library to create a very small HTTP server. We're using the base HTTP request handler and the HTTP server uh, components from this library, HTTP.server. And we are creating a, if we just scroll down here, sorry, we're creating a single endpoint, which is called forward slash tree counter. And it's running a method called get tree counter. This is in turn calling a function that's called fetch tree count. And what this function is doing is essentially the bulk of our service in this case. So what we're doing is we're calling the trees API, which is actually an Ecosia API that returns the number of trees that have been planted up to date by Ecosia users. Um, the thing is that we want to monitor this application and have an idea of how it's behaving. This application would actually be rather, um, it wouldn't fail very often, let's say because of the awesome work that people like Vanessa and the other engineers who are on the team working on this, uh, all their work. So because that's not going to be as interesting for the purpose of the workshop, what we're actually going to do is inject a little artificial uh, failure. So this next part you'll see is setting at a random interval an artificial 503. That's a server error. And you're going to see later why we're doing this and why it's more interesting, um, but just to give you an idea of what's going on. I'm not going to go into great detail of the rest of this Python code because hopefully you already have some familiarity with Python. Um, and the purpose of this is really just to have the smallest viable um, component that we can then instrument and collect metrics on. Um, but if you are interested, you can, as Vanessa said, always reach out to us and we can maybe go into things in slightly more detail. Um, the other thing to point out here is the util.py. It has the artificial 503 call um, and we also have an artificial latency, uh, which I believe for the time being is actually not being used. When run, this actually has templates so that we can create a bit more of a beautiful uh, version. And this is thanks also to Vanessa using those front end skills. And we are really uh, had a lot of fun with this to get it showing the number of uh, trees planted by Ecosia users, but also the logo. Uh, for the keen eye, you might notice that it's using the old branding. So please forgive us for that. And if we refresh a few times here, you can see we're at the tree count at endpoint. Eventually, of course, it doesn't happen now. We will see our server failure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the good thing is you can see the trees are all going up. There we go. Oh, zero trees. What happened to all of the trees? OK, don't worry. The trees are not gone. They're still there. Uh, but this is that 503 latency error that we saw built in. OK, let's just take it back quickly to the repository and show you a couple more things um, before we move on. Um, at the root of the directory, you're going to see a number of um, Docker files and config YAMLs. Don't worry about those. We've used them to be able to set up for the third and fourth section of this workshop. Um, and if you're interested in them, you can take a deeper look to see how we've configured things. Um, mainly, you will have to check the documentation for Prometheus and Grafana to see what those values should be. But essentially, we've provided you with a working setup. The other thing you're going to see is a make file. And the commands that we tend to use um, to run our application locally um, is make commands. If you're on Windows, unfortunately, make will not be available to you. So what you're going to need to do is look inside the make file itself and copy the commands individually. But hopefully it shouldn't cost or too much. Or maybe install make. Actually, on Windows, it's not that difficult. There is a tool called Chocolately. Chocolately? I don't know. Like a package oh. manager. So you can just okay. do choco install make, and then you have it. That's what I have. So ah. if you don't use this package manager, I do suggest you start doing this. Like it makes my life so much easier. Yeah, that's perfect. I um, Yeah, I guess 
that must be relatively new or I just wasn't aware and my understanding was that you just couldn't use make <laughs> so even better you can yes <laughs> please use make <laughs> even if you're on windows um, the other thing in here is the readme. I'd like to point that out because I realize not everyone likes to learn in the way of like um, uh, visual workshops with slides or on video. So we also have a pretty comprehensive readme that you can use as like a text-based uh, version of this workshop. And I think the last thing I would like to mention, if I've not forgotten anything else, but I'm sure Vanessa will let me know, is um, we always welcome um, PRs for like updates or corrections or additions. So, you know, if you, we're not perfect, sometimes we make mistakes or we've missed something. So if you see something that can improve this workshop for the next iteration, feel free to open a PR and it's very welcome. So let me just switch back to my slides. And we're going to move on to our first section challenge. Awesome. Thanks, Jess. Um, so we are now going to go ahead and just jump right in. So um, for those of you watching at home, you're feel free to just um, participate if you would like or sit back if you feel like you would prefer to do this on your own. As Jessica mentioned, um, we've detailed all the steps very explicitly in the README. And if you watched our workshop from PyCon DE, you'll notice that we've actually repurposed these slides to be very explicit about the things that you need to do so that uh, when we're no longer present with you um, live right now, you're still able to really understand what it is that you need to do, the changes that you need to make. So step one, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well and show you my code editor. Um, I believe Jess will continue to have this slide up so that you're able to see um, the instructions, but otherwise I will read them aloud to you myself as well. I'm not sure if it will stream both, so. Oh, it won't, yeah, so yeah you'll have to stop. It will not, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. No worries. So, um, I'm now sharing my code editor. Can you confirm that you see my code editor? Maybe if yeah, you can cool. zoom you. in a little bit. Cool. I will zoom in yeah. one more. Perfect. Thank you. So if you're wondering why my code editor is like in a square shape, it is because I unfortunately don't have my usual setup where I have two screens. So I really have to maximize the real estate of my one little screen um so i hope this is big enough and visible for you all to see um and yeah let's just get right in okay so um sadly just cannot share the um the other slide um but i will read aloud to you what it is that we want to do at the moment so um as Jess mentioned, the bulk of what we're going to be doing is working inside of this main.py uh, file. And I would also like to preface that I myself am not a Python expert by any means. So it's also part of the reason why I really enjoy volunteering um, to do anything with Jess because she is a, a far greater expert than I am in Python. And so I'm always able to learn from her. Um, so just keep that in mind as we're making these changes and cool, let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do, so I'm on, I'm currently on the main branch right now um, and we have the solution available to you um, on, I won't pull up GitHub, but oops, it will be solution, section one solution. So. Um, what we're going to do is you're going to watch the changes that I implement here on main and then um, you can do it yourself and then you can compare against uh, the actual solution that you'll find in the section one solution branch um, on GitHub or locally. Okay, cool. So the first thing that we want to do oh, um, is that we're going to want to make sure um, that we're able to expose our base metrics. And in order to do that, we're going to have to make a few changes here. 
Um, so first, we're going to want to import the metrics handler from the Prometheus Python client. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, cool. So um, Prometheus underscore client metrics handler. Okay. And then what we're going to have to do is remember to then remove this base HTTP request handler, right? Since we're then replacing it with the metrics handler from the Prometheus client. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove this. And then uh, I'm going to go and make sure to make that respective change here. So we want to replace the base handler with the Prometheus metrics handler. I'm going to go ahead and save these changes. And then um, I also want to make sure that more importantly, I'm also remembering to make the metrics endpoint accessible because now that we've replaced the original um, base base handler um, with the metrics handler from Prometheus, we also now want to be able to access these metrics, this metric endpoint. So one second here. So I really want to make sure that I'm typing out so that we're, you know, doing this together essentially. Um, so metrics. Um, to make sure that my indentation is correct. Okay, and then I want to actually return. I want to make sure I don't have a typo for the live demo. Okay. Okay, cool. So I think I've made all the changes that I needed to do now. So in total, those were three changes, right? So just to recap what we did, um, importing oh, the metrics handler from the Prometheus Python client, that is done. We've replaced the base HTTP request handler with the metrics handler. And then we've also made it so that we can access the metrics endpoint. Um, Jess, do you see anything that I've forgotten? Because I feel like I have everything. I can't see you at the moment. No, right no, sorry. I missed the clicking the unmute button, of course. Oh, <laughs> I'm, no I think this looks good. And maybe one comment we can say around what we're doing in that endpoint is we're okay. using the super um, function. Uh, this is a Python classes thing. And we do that so we can access the functions that are in the parent class. Um, so we're essentially, here. yeah taking the parent class uh, do get for this endpoint. Cool. But, yeah, otherwise, it's good. Maybe we should run it and see. Yeah, let's test it Hopefully out. Hopefully it okay. works. <laughs> yeah, so cool. you can compare the changes that you've implemented um, yourself, or if you feel like you would rather um, just like see the result in action, you can also just check out the section one solution branch and then run um, make dev. So I'm going to make sure I run make dev. And also just to note, if this is the first time that you're running make dev, it might take a little while. Um, cool, that was quick. And now I realize I'm only sharing my editor window. 
but I will rectify that one second. Wow, it's really um, kind of a pain to have one screen. I didn't realize this because I've had multiple screens for such a long time. Cool. So let me share this next window. Um, great. So what you didn't see is that before I ran my dev, this was just like an unavailable web page. Um, but now that make dev is running, I can see our lovely tree counter. Woohoo! And oh, nice! Straight away, something is wrong. And remember that we added the slash metrics endpoint, and now, as you can see, I am visiting that endpoint and we have lots of base metrics available to us um it's not super important for you to understand in great detail what all this information means we're going to cover it in the following slides but just to summarize we've gone through and replaced um the initial base met the base handler um, with the metrics handler from prometheus and we added um, we made it possible to access the metrics endpoint those were the two um, key things that we did here so um, just for those of you who are curious so these base metrics they're metrics that are automatically exposed to you when you initially have only just added the base metrics handler. Um, so we're gonna get uh, into more detail about how you add more metrics and create your own custom metrics. Um, but essentially what these base metrics are giving us information about are information, for example, about like number of times that garbage collection has occurred. And we will show you later in this presentation like not only how to interpret and understand these metrics but also how to very practically make use of them um, visually more visually um so if you have managed to make it this far congratulations because that was the end of section one and now i'm going to stop sharing my screen does that automatically stop sharing the screen i can't really tell from the it feedback. does yeah great cool sounds good um so given that i only have one screen i would ask if jess could very kindly uh share the next slides and i will present but um she can just share the slides Thumbs up to confirm you see them. Yeah, looks good. Cool. Okay, let me just get resituated here. One sec. Cool. Okay. So um, we went through the process now of like step one, actually trying to make it possible to instrument um, our Python application um, with access to the Prometheus metrics handler. And we saw that we had, uh, when we access slash metrics, we were given uh, what we called, what we referred to as base metrics. And I mentioned that these are sort of like out of the box default metrics. Um, and they are generally useful, right? They are valuable to have, um, but sometimes there are other pieces of information that we're interested in having. Um, so as a result, we want to make sure that we are creating custom metrics. And for those of you who perhaps don't have any experience, um, like any professional experience with metrics so far, um, you can, you can, um, sort of I'm confirming to you that creating custom metrics is a thing that you do often. Um, so you can expect that what we're going to take you through at the moment is something that you will come across potentially in your careers or have already come across. So, um, but when we define custom metrics, there are a few parts that compose, um, that compose a custom metric. So next slide, please. Um, Firstly, we need to choose a type, um, a data type for our custom metric. Um, we've included a screenshot for you um, 
throughout these slides so that you could visualize what a custom metric would be like and our, we're, we want to highlight for you the components that make it up. So firstly, we would choose a data type and the type that we've chosen here is the type counter. I won't go too much into details about the specifics of types, um, but you should definitely read more about this on the Prometheus documentation. But in a nutshell, a counter is essentially a type of metric that will constantly increment by one, right? It will never go down, it will only ever go up. So we can expect that the counter will increase. So from one to two to three and so on and so forth. Uh, next, we need a base name for our metric. So in this case, the base name that we've chosen for this metric is requests total. So total requests. Thirdly, um, in a perfect world, you would have a, a description that is really explicit. So we can see here that the description that we've chosen to give our custom metric is request. It's just request. Um, and I would say that we've already identified a really good situation in which we could make a small improvement because requests, you know, when I, when I as an engineer have to interact with this metric, um, requests doesn't really tell me much about what it is that I should be understanding here. So we would have an opportunity to update this to be more explicit and we, we could say total number of requests. Um, and that would already be a lot more helpful because then I would understand that it's not just like, you know, it is very clearly total, the total number of uh, requests. And then lastly, we want to make sure that we have labels, uh, labels on our custom metrics. And we want to make sure that we always add labels um, because this will really help in, in the long term with filtering and being able to sort through all of the metrics that we have. So just to bring some context, um, this workshop will be creating a custom metric and we'll have a couple labels, but in a real production um, professional environment, you'll have um, hundreds of metrics and usually with um, the, accessing the same custom metric. And so when you have labels attached to them, you're able to really sort through all the services um, that are making use of this metric. And you'll be able to then go into Grafana, like we'll do a little bit later, and then very clearly see where all of the data is coming from. So it's really, really useful to be able to use labels to split um, this information out. Um, so now that we've sort of gone through the theoretical process of creating a custom metric, we want to actually be able to make use of this metric. Um, and in order to make, um, to use it, we need to, uh, we need to make use of the increment method, right? We want to be able to call our custom metric counter. So, um, I also want to note for you that it's very, very important um, to be mindful of where you are placing the call to the metric um, because it will, it will impact the information that you receive. So for example, in the screenshot, we've placed, we've placed the custom metric within the fetch tree count function. So this means that this will increment, this, this increment will be called each time we make a request to the get tree count. Um, we will show you more of how this works in practice uh, coming up soon, but definitely be mindful of the fact that positioning uh, of the metric is, the increment is important. Cool. All right, so we just saw what implementing a custom metric would theoretically look, look like in code. But now we also want to show you what they would look like, what it would look like um, actually rendered as a metric in action. So if you remember, um, I showed you the I showed you preview of this, what it would look like to access uh, slash metrics, right? And we saw that it was like a wall of, of text essentially. Um, so when we would now revisit slash metrics, assuming that we have our new custom metric, um, 
we would see that we would uh, immediately see the base name that we gave it. Remember, so the base name that we decided to give it was requests total. And the next step uh, would be a useful description. So remember, in this case, we decided to only write requests, but again, we want to make sure that we uh, are being as explicit as possible. So we would have updated this ideally to total number of requests as the description that we would see. And we also talked about adding labels. And here we very clearly see that the two labels that we've added our endpoint and status. So at the moment, or when we first started before the first exercise, uh, if you remember, we did have only the slash tree endpoint, um, tree counter endpoint. Um, and then we added uh, an, another one, uh, metrics, and the status of the status in this case is 200. Um, but when you add more services, when you have more services, um, they will then be available in the endpoint as well, as well as the status that is actually returned when you try and access um, that service. And last but not least, we are seeing the type which we declared. So to recap, the type that we decided to choose was of type counter, and that is very clearly displayed for us here. Awesome, thank you for that walkthrough, Vanessa. So now the challenge uh, two is that we're gonna add a custom metric. And this time I'm gonna code along and try and follow all those great instructions that Vanessa just gave us. Um, essentially, uh, we broke it into three steps. So first we're gonna try add a custom counter metric. And what we're gonna try do with that is count the requests with the status code as a label. Um, and maybe we'll add the endpoint as well, because Vanessa's also pointed out how we can do that. Um, once we've added this metric, we're then gonna need to rerun the server. Um, so we're gonna have to stop it if you already have it running, don't forget, because um, otherwise you will see an error saying that the port is already in use. Um, and we want to restart it so that we um, can see these changes in the live application. So, then to test this, we're going to refresh that main application page, the photo slash tree counter, a few times, and then we're going to check metrics. And hopefully, all going well, we're going to be able to look at our custom metric, uh, and it should look pretty similar to what Vanessa's just showed us. So I'm going to just switch over to my code editor. So bear with me one minute. Hopefully this one. Can you all just compare, uh, confirm? Yeah, awesome. Okay, so um, I've already checked out the solution one branch. Um, so if you didn't have chance to run through with Vanessa the last one, um, you can slightly cheat by taking the uh, solution branch that we already created for you uh, so that you can keep going uh, and don't have to pause the video. And um, what we're going to first do is we're going to create our custom metrics. So let's maybe create this under here. Um, we're going to have it be about requests. And we're going to have it be a counter. So I feel like request counter is a super name. We need to tell um, that it's going to be of the type counter. And then we want to put in, as Vanessa said, the name which is going to be request total um, because this is a count so it's only incrementing upwards. We're going to put in a description. So I'm definitely not going to put in just requests because I know that request uh, that Vanessa asked the SRE will be mad at me. So I'm definitely going to put something in a little more explicit. So let's go for a uh, total number of requests. I think that's what you, you said you would uh, suggest. And then let's put in two labels. Um, we'll do the status and we'll do the endpoint, uh, just like Vanessa mentioned. Um, we do need to import still this counter, and that's going to be up here from the Prometheus client. So, I'm sorry, lots of spelling mistakes here. Uh, oh. I love it when VS Code is trying to be useful, but then it's just getting in the way. Okay, perfect. And now we have our request counter. So yeah, 
let's think about where we're going to add this because Vanessa also mentioned that that's going to make a bit of a difference. And maybe what we can start with is doing it in the same place um, that we saw in the slides, just so that you're like familiar with that. So if we call our type and we want to call the labels method on it so that we can um, set the labels, we're going to set the status code here to uh, what we get back from the request uh, to the trees API that we call above. And we're going to call the endpoint here um, upstream. Um, the reason for that is because uh, this is essentially when we're calling the upstream trees API. So that's the Ecosia API. It's not our own services uh, tree counter endpoint. And before I forget, we need to make sure we actually call increment. Otherwise, our counter would be there, but it wouldn't be incrementing. So before I run this, one thing to maybe just think about is, what about if I would move this down to here? So I think this is something that we can commonly see as a bug in uh, when we're calling metrics. And it's something really to look out for. And this is why we're saying you have to be mindful about where you're calling it, not only because it might tell you different information, but it, you might also miss information. So in this case, I wouldn't even get to this line if the status code had been 200 um, because I already return. So I would have a counter, but I would only uh, see any metrics that were available for the 503. So it's just something to be mindful of. Um, these are like, let's say, small mistakes that we can all make because we're all human. Uh, so if you're looking through a code review, they're good things also to be checking for. Okay, um, I think I have everything in there. I have my uh, endpoint already in here, right? Let me just check metrics handler. Yes, I am on the right branch. All right, let's run make dev. Um, so now I have to switch back, I'm afraid, to show you the browser. Sorry, I have two screens and it's still not enough somehow. Okay, hopefully now that you're seeing the tree counter endpoint of our application that's running and we're just going to run it a few times um, so that we actually have a couple of numbers here. I think you saw at least uh, one run there that had the, 50, the artificial 503, so it displayed zero trees. Um, and we've got a couple there that is returning a tree number, so that is perfect. So let's take a look at our metrics Oops. endpoint. Perfect. We have an endpoint, so that is beneficial. Let me just make this a bit longer. And if we scroll down and zoom in, um, we can see here that we have our request counter, custom metric. Woo! It was successful. Thank goodness. Um, the other thing that we can see here that we maybe didn't see in the slide was we actually have two buckets in this case. Um, and the reason being is that it's splitting it by the labels and we have uh, buckets for the two different status codes. So the 503 is the artificial uh, 503 when we saw the zero and we had two of them. And then the 200 is the uh, successful call where we saw the tree count value and we had five of those. So in total, we actually had um, seven calls to this uh, API. Now, that's all good, but we did also talk about this whole concept of um, where we're calling the metric and the impact that that plays. So if you can bear with me one minute, I do want to switch back to my code and just add in a second counter metric. So this time, what I'm actually going to do is um, I'm going to copy paste it because I think we'll all do that in our day-to-day -day life. Um, and we're going to add this now into the get tree counter. So I'm going to choose to place this just before we write out. 
Um, here for the status code, I'm going to put it as a hard coded uh, 200 because um, we actually already have set that up here in the do head. Uh, sorry down here in the do in the do head um, so we know that it will be 200 at this point when it's returning and what we're going to put for the endpoint is we're going to put that this is the tree counter endpoint so this counter now to my mind is counting the number of requests to our um, applications endpoint okay don't forget to stop running your application and restart it otherwise you'll be confused uh which has happened to me multiple times and let's switch back over to the browser just to take a quick look how that looks before we move on so first of all let's just check our application is running and it's still returning uh yeah perfect we saw the artificial 503 Okay, and now let's have a look at our metrics. Okay, so now what you can see is a little bit different. We've got three buckets and you'll see one of them has the tree counter endpoint. What you'll also see is this, uh, the sum of the two for upstream equal the total for the tree counter endpoint. And that's expected. So by having metrics in different places, we can kind of measure different things and communicate different things about how our application is running. In this point, we know that our user did see something when they navigated to this endpoint of tree counter. They got a page, it just may not have had the number of trees. If we want to look deeper, we can see where we failed in our call to the upstream API, and that means that the number was not shown. So I'm just going to stop sharing there, or actually, I guess I have to reshift to share the slides. Um, so. <laughs> Bear with me while I'm juggling all of these screens around. Hopefully you were able to follow along. Uh, if you weren't, you can always pause the video and take a look back to see what was covered. And as we mentioned, we also have in the readme for, uh, for this repository, lots of tips and also some links out to the documents uh, documentation sorry for uh, Prometheus. So we have reached that point where we would like to see if anybody has any questions on what we've covered so far. Yeah, I do have. So I noticed that you have actually like there are two things appeared. So first the counters, right? But then there is also this gauge or gauge, I don't know how to pronounce it. <clears throat> so what is this thing? That is a good point. Uh, maybe I can flip back over to the metrics. Am I still sharing my screen? Yes, mm -hmm. right? Um, yes. So, Alexi, you're asking, okay, so I see the, let me make this a bit wider because I can't read that. So, I'm pretty sure you can't either. Uh, we can see all the buckets for the request counter, um, but we're also seeing a different data type here. Um, which is the gauge. So, and as you can also see, this has like the three different buckets. Um, and the gauge is something that Prometheus client gives us automatically when we have a count, a type counter. So the data measurement type counter. So we can use the gauge to kind of see the distribution of um, the different uh, buckets that we have. But in this case, we want to use, uh, we're just going to use the counter value when we come to querying it and visualizing it. Um, the Prometheus documentation goes into greater detail of like how you can query these later in PomQL and what you can use them for. And um, different data types will give you kind of like different things uh, in, in your uh, metrics endpoint. OK, thank you. And um, so in this workshop, we use this metrics handler, but uh, what does it actually do inside? I, I guess we just delegated all the work to this, but I'm wondering what's uh, what's happening inside this thing. Um, maybe I can take this one. And um, so uh, essentially, I think, understand the question correctly, but jump in and 
uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the question is about the fact that we inheriting now from the metrics handler instead of the base HTTP request handler. So um, is that roughly? Yeah, but like, what is it doing exactly? Like, how does it prepare this? Uh... Because uh, in usual situations, uh, I personally don't use these HTTP handlers. I use tools like, I don't know, Flask, for example. And then uh, the reason I'm asking this question is, let's say I use something like Flask. In this situation, I will not be able to extend this metrics handler. How do I do this? How I, I guess I will need to implement this logic. But if I don't know what's happening inside, how do I do this? Um, so, yeah, OK. Now I understand a bit more you know. So um there we have other use cases also, right? Where you don't even have any HTTP server running, but you might still want to uh, collect metrics. Um, for example, uh, if you have like a, a job written in Python. Um, so there are different ways that you can collect the metrics. Uh, you probably you, you uh, potentially would need to run an additional server that has this endpoint exposed. But what you can also do is, I think I mentioned earlier um, that Prometheus is scraping the application. You can also set up something that's called a push gateway, which um, in, instead of doing the scraping action, you can like push the metrics there. So there are a couple of different ways to interact with this. I um, would probably not go around trying to write this um, logic myself. Um, I'm not sure if Flask, for example, has some sort of additional plugin that you can put there uh, to be able to add this uh, endpoint to its base server, or you could run a second HTTP server. Yep, thank you. And then we have a question from VK. If I'm troubleshooting and troubleshooting an issue, how this monitoring dashboard will help me identify and, and pinpoint the issue? Um, this is a great question, and uh, I think we will have some more visual examples in the upcoming sessions, but essentially, um, so the question is, if I'm trying to troubleshoot an issue with my service, um, how am I able to then use the dashboard to understand what's happening? And uh, the answer to that is, for example, we see that we're... Um, we have a label that we added to our custom metric of status. So we're collecting instances of 200s, which are successful requests, and then also for 503s, which are the artificial errors that we've injected. So supposing this were a real life scenario, you would have a dashboard panel that would then show you the sort of the, the health, the health of your service. And you would, you know, come to, you know, wake up every morning and then check your dashboard and you would say, okay, my service is returning 200s, everything is good. But if some suddenly your, um, you know, your customers were complaining that, you know, they're not able to access a, a service as they expect to, you would go into your dashboard and you would be able to see, huh, there's an increase in, you know, 404s or 503s. And this would help confirm to you that something is um, actually happening. Um, and this would be how you would interpret and make use of the metrics visually. Um, but of course, there would be other things that you would troubleshoot, um, that you would be able to troubleshoot. But if we're talking specifically about how we would be able to use the data and the dashboards, this is how it, you would use it to validate um, a claim that something is wrong. Thank you. I don't see any questions so far in addition, in addition to that. This is a perfect segue into the next section of the workshop. So like for the uh, next half an hour. And um, we can also take some questions at the end if there's more popping up. Um, so yeah, thank you for the great questions. And now we're going to move on to something slightly different or completely different. Um, and we're going to look at metric queries and creating dashboards. So exactly what this question from Vicky was about. Um, so. What we're going to do now is also switch how we're running the applications uh, locally. So before you were using um, make dev, and that was under the hood running um, the Python application with poetry and only the Python application. But now we're going to use Docker and Docker Compose 
so that we can actually have the application running, but also an instance of Prometheus and Grafana. Um, so when you run Docker Compose up in the root of the repository, you will see lots of log outputs, um, hopefully no errors, um, but do let us know if you see errors. And we will then also be able to access the various different applications at the different endpoints. So Prometheus is by convention normally 1990. Um, our application is still at 8,001. So if you do have the application running, do remember to shut it down before running Docker Compose up or you will have a port conflict. And Grafana is gonna run at uh, 3,000. Okay, so the challenge for this section um, is gonna be using prom query language, also known as prom QL, to be able to query our metrics. What we need to do is run the app and Prometheus by using the Docker com Compose command, which I just mentioned. And then we're gonna query the metrics in the Prometheus UI using PromQL. So I'm gonna go along and do this with you. Um, and I will essentially do this all in the browser. So I've already run Docker Compose up. Um, it can take a, a while when you run it the first time because it has to download all the dependencies. Um, but hopefully once you have that up and running, you'll still be able to access your application at the local host 8001 forward slash tree counter. Still be able to see all those wonderful trees. Um, you should still be able to see the metrics. If you haven't completed section two, you can also check out the branch section two solution, um, which already has the two, um, the uh, two, counters that I just showed you uh, the implementation for. So it has the one that's running for the upstream and the one that's running for the application tree count at endpoint. But what you should have that's also now new is you should be able to access Prometheus UI at 1990. And you can see that here. So we're gonna use a minimum amount of this UI because we're then gonna jump pretty quickly over to Grafana uh, because generally uh, we find it a tool that kind of does most of what Prometheus offers us in this UI, uh, but on a scale that is kind of more useful for our day-to-day. -day. So we can create dashboards and uh, various panels, which um, Vanessa is gonna show you. Um, but the reason why we wanted to also show you this UI is because it can also be useful um, for kind of just exploring what different metrics you have. Actually, uh, since we started creating this workshop, um, which was a little while ago, uh, the Grafana interface got a lot better for their explore function. So to be honest, you could skip uh, needing to learn the Prometheus UI, um, but yeah. We're going to use it. I think it's like still useful to know it's there uh, in case you're also using some sort of different solution for your dashboard building. Um, OK, so one thing that I want to just double check is that this application is still up and running. Yes, it is. OK. Um, and what we should be able to do with the enable autocomplete on is we should be able to already see our metric come up request toll. And we're just going to execute that as it is. So we're just going to request that as it is. And we can see we have two. Um, both were with the status code 200, but one uh, was for the upstream and one was for the tree count. We can also see a couple of other labels in here. And um, that's kind of other things that we would be able to filter on. Um, as Vanessa mentioned, maybe you have multiple uh, services or applications using a cost, uh, like a, a common custom metric. Uh, and then this can be really useful so you can get a little bit more granular. So maybe we're going to decide that actually, while this is all well and good, we're only really interested in our upstream. Let's say empty query. <laughs> I think there's something going on in the background with my application here. Let's just run this. Here we go. So now we can see uh, that we have uh, a count of four. And uh, this is only for the upstream. We no longer see the tree count at endpoint uh, because we filtered them out. And currently, they're all 200. <laughs> 
um, which means that I could filter further and filter on status, but while they're all 200, it doesn't really, uh, you have to just believe me <laughs> that it's filtering it out. Let's see if we can get the artificial 503. If you're not able to get the artificial 503, you could also um, change the uh, percentage of times that it's shown. Um, so it's a little bit more interesting for you. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right, but what you hopefully what you can see uh, see from what I've explained is that you could also put in here uh, the status and restrict only on a certain uh, status code, um, and <laughs> not quite sure why that keeps uh, coming up like that. But uh, and then you would only see the ones with the status code two hundred. In this case, that was actually all of them, and um, so you know we are like filtering a little further than we maybe need to. Um, the other thing that we can do, which is quite powerful with PromQL and Prometheus, and we will use um, in Grafana because we also use PromQL um, queries, is we can do things uh, like getting the sum. Or actually, let me, instead of the sum, I'm going to do the increase. And when we do the increase, we do need to give it a um, range vector. Now, range vector is a time duration. In this case, you, it's 5M, that stands for five minutes. And that's the duration that it will look back for the relevant time series that we're querying on. Um, if we then click on the graph, we kind of get more of an indication of what this is actually showing us. And here we can see uh, that we are, our maximum is 20, but we can see over time how many um, of the queries are matching our filtering. So in this case, status, uh, status code 200 and the endpoint being the upstream. So this offers us some tooling. This offers us some ways of being able to uh, dig into our data essentially, dig into our statistics, our metrics and see what's happening. But this certainly wouldn't be a way that I would maybe wanna look at the application when I've been woken up at three in the morning because I'm on call. And as we mentioned at the start, it's really about the communication uh, aspect. And I think we are now gonna show you a tool that kind of does a better job of showing that. So I'm gonna hand over now to Vanessa I'm not sure if you want me to keep sharing for this slide and then hand over to you. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fine to keep the slide up and then I will take over the presentation. Um, but yeah, thanks for that. That was a really informative and also um, is the basis for what we're about to do now, um, which is going to be building a dashboard. So we've gone now and created our custom metric, but as someone asked, um, in the questions, you know, how do we actually make use of this custom metric and how do we um, actually interpret it, you know, when in a real life setting. So um, I'm shortly going to present uh, Grafana for you, but before that, um, make sure that you, if you haven't already, in the section two solution branch, um, run, uh, Docker Compose up build, which we have um, here in the slide, but also you are able to access in the GitHub readme and then go to localhost 3000. So uh, I am now going to take over the presentation. Cool. And I will also preface that my um, little chaos monkey, my dog, is awake now. So if you hear some barking, she's usually a good girl, but um, if you hear something, it's her. I hope it's not too distracting. Alrighty. So I'm going to go ahead now. And um, so I'm actually not going to share my editor because I have already run the Docker Compose up build command locally. So I'm just going to go ahead straight and share um, the Grafana UI with you all. So bear with me here. Okay. Great. 
Okay, so can I just get a thumbs up that you see this window? And do you see the trees planted now? Yeah, exactly. Yes? Fantastic. Great. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to click away from you all for a bit and I will expand this window. Okay, awesome. So this is not to not to pick favorites, but this is my personal favorite part of this um, workshop uh, because this is also what I've been doing a lot um, on a regular basis. Uh, it's one of my key tasks as an SRE is to enable engineers to really understand um, how their services are operating and to help advise them as to how they can take the metrics that they create for their services, the custom metrics that they create, and then implement them in a way that's useful. So um, if you, by the way, I also want to mention that um, I, I'm already within the, like I've already accessed Grafana, but if you are now running it for the first time, you will need a login username and password. And those are accessible to you inside of the readme. So make sure that you use those and then that will grant you access to this main page here. Okay, cool. So um, I'd like to point out that when you end up in this home page, <clears throat> you're able to straight away make a panel if you like. However, we're gonna go through the process of creating a dashboard because we want to, you know, we want to emulate what it would be like to be in a real professional uh, production setting. So <clears throat> now if you're wondering, why we want to make a dashboard. We're about to add a single panel, but the reason why we would want to create a dashboard is because we would ideally have several panels that belong to, for example, a specific service. Um, so we can assume that, for example, we have a we have a tree service at Ecosia. And uh, as an SRE, one of the things that we like to impart into all of our engineers is that when they are deciding, you know, what information, what information should we be visualizing for our service? We always like to um, suggest that they visualize for um, key pieces of information. Um, and they're like commonly known as golden signals. So signals that are really important to have available and visible to you as a service or application owner. And just, I won't get too specific, um, too deep into detail about what these are, but essentially um, as a service owner, as an engineer, you would want to make sure that you are visualizing data for um, the error rate, latency, um, traffic and saturation. So an error rate is one that we will actually be touching on today. Um, and uh, that would be like, you know, 400s, 500s um, status code um, that are returned. Um, latency would be, for example, like the time it actually takes to respond to a request. Um, traffic would be like the user demand. So in this case, request per second. Um, and saturation would be like the overall capacity of your system. So like CPU and memory. Um, if you are not familiar with this, like, Professionally, that's okay, no worries. Um, but I really want to uh, explain, like express the fact that in a professional like production setting, there will be a ton of metric, metric information that you have available to you. And when you are an on-call engineer like myself or Jessica, which means that you are uh, responsible for responding to services that even you are not, um, you haven't worked on necessarily. It's important that the information that we're displaying in these dashboards are actually useful, is useful and tells us a story about the status of a service. So let's just get straight into it. So I've created a new dashboard and I'm going to create a new panel. And so um, if you haven't used Grafana anymore uh, before, uh, I want you to know that it can be quite overwhelming for the first time. Grafana is a wonderful tool. It's really powerful for visualizing data, your information. And um, as a result, you have a ton of freedom um, at your disposal. So 
for the sake of today, I want to start off by selecting um, the visualization type of stat. And I'll show you a, a few different examples, but this is where I want us to start off. So as Jessica mentioned, um, we are going to be using PromQL, right? Uh, Prometheus has its own query language, which is called PromQL, Prometheus query language. And um, you should already have the data source be set as Prometheus, which means that you will now have access to all the data. And we can just get straight into composing our first metric to be visualized here in this panel. Um, one of the things that I really like about um, Grafana is that it auto-completes, um, it auto-suggests to you options for what it infers that you're trying to visualize, and I will just show you. So we created a custom metric called request total, and as you can see, I just started typing and it immediately started suggesting options to me. So I know that the custom metric that we created is called request total. So I'm going to go ahead and save some time and I'm going to click um, select this request total. Now I'm going to just um, add some opening braces. And even just by doing that alone, it's already suggesting the labels that are available. So um, as you might remember, the labels that we added um, were endpoint and status, but we also have some more information available to us here. For the sake of this presentation, we'll just focus on the labels that we've added, so endpoint and status. So I'm going to select status and wow, even more awesome, it's suggesting to me the options that are available. So interestingly, I want to highlight the fact that at the moment, it's only offering me a status of 200, which is interesting. And that means that we haven't yet had a 503, an artificial 503. So I'm going to go ahead and, oh, perfect, perfect. The stars are aligning. But I want to go ahead and re refresh this a few times. So we just saw previously before I refreshed that we had an artificial 503. I'm just going to refresh this a couple of times. Okay, refreshing, you know, users are, you know, we like instant feedback. Back in this uh, in age, we really like often. So when you're building a service, this is something that you should take into account. Okay, oh, I'm seeing another artificial 503. Great, so now I've refreshed the page a few times and so now, as you can see, it's suggesting to me not only 200 statuses, but also 503s, because we've had some instances now of 503s. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and pick a status of 200. And interesting. So now that I've um, declared this metric, that I've written this metric here, um, it's giving me two you know, two pieces of information. But we want to actually have this be useful to us, right? We want to make it so that um, it gives us like something that's understandable. So I'm going to go ahead and move away from stat. So the stat that you see here, the number that you see here is the, um, the number of requests, right? The total number of requests. Request total is the metric name. So I've refreshed the page um 13 times yeah oh interesting yeah so this has made 13 requests to the endpoint of tree counter i hope this is big enough for you oops oh i don't know why that's not bigger but essentially you can see here the information that it's breaking down so it says there have been 13 requests in total to the endpoint of tree counter of status 200 because i've d defined it that i only want status 200 and then to the endpoint of upstream, there have been 12. Okay. But we want to actually make this a little bit more useful and practical. So I've gone now and changed the, visual, the visualization type from stat to time series. And now I want to go ahead and sum this in a way that is a bit more useful. 
So I'm going to wrap the requests total into a sum, and then I'm going to say I want to group them, sum them up by status and endpoint. And let's see what happens here. Cool. So now we see that the information has been reduced and it's been now condensed um, and it's also more understandable. So now in our panel, we can see that we have a green total number of requests to the tree counter, as well as the status 200. Does someone have a comment? I can hear the, the unmute. You uh, froze a couple of times, um, but I don't think any information was lost. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, feel free to interject and let me know if I froze or you know, if I could, should repeat anything. Um, but just to recap what I was mentioning. So now we have two visual data points. So green line represents a uh, request, total number of requests to the endpoint tree counter with the status of 200. And the yellow line uh, signifies the total number of requests to the endpoint of upstream with a status of 200. Okay, but let's make this a bit more interesting. Request total. And what I really like, honestly, like my, my general day-to-day -day is really just playing around in here um, and trying to make use of this information. Um, oh, I see, there's an extra, why is it erroring? There's an extra, cool. Okay, cool. So, Okay, cool. So uh, for those of you who remember earlier, I mentioned um, that we want this information to be useful to us. We want to create a useful panel. So we would, for example, write um, request total. We would then have to edit this panel to be a bit more informative for the engineers who are gonna come in and interact with this panel. So we would update update the panel title to total number of requests. Total number of requests. And we can even be, we can create this panel to be total number of unsuccessful requests. Unsuccessful spelling. Or total number of 503s, for example, this would that would be very explicitly what we see here, right? Because we're saying here that we want to see the total number of requests that have had a status of 503. Um, but we can also then do, instead of status, we can just do endpoint. And rather than focusing on status, I just want to see all of the information for my tree counter. Cool. Okay. So then total number of requests to tree counter. And we would actually write it in this way. Cool. And we could then make use of the legend to, for example, say status. And endpoint. This is really oh, I see, I see, I remember. So it would be endpoint first because yes, cool. So then you can go into the legend and then you can do something like this if you want to make it more human readable. What we saw before was like a bit less uh, understandable from like, you know, if you wake up at two in the morning and it's like a lot of, we want to reduce the mental overhead of having to like process information. So um, we would, for example, be able to in the legend edit so that we have just 
endpoint and tree counter. However, this would be a little bit redundant in this case because we've already been explicit about the title. So this panel is clearly showing total number of requests to slash tree counter. So we could even say status. We could say something like status 200. So we would then see a status of 200 here, and then we would go ahead and save. Um, so we can either apply or save. When you apply a change, it doesn't save it. So this is really important to remember. If I now navigate away or close this window, this change will be unsaved, but I really want to make sure that I'm saving my dashboard. So I've created a new dashboard and we are supposing that this, the information that will be reflected here is belongs to the tree counter service. So I want to then name my dashboard as such and then I will actually save it. So then when I refresh it, I can go away and, oh, I've gone away. And now when I come to the home page, I can see that I have recently viewed dashboards, tree counter service. And to the, to the question of the person who asked, um, how you would you know make use of this data um as an engineer you would you know ideally come and check proactively on the health of your service um and you would see oh so far there have only been status 200s um to the tree counter so um i can infer from this that um the requests are being able to be made successfully to the endpoint of tree counter Um, I awesome. Think. Um, we're a bit tight on time, I guess. Uh, so maybe we can just show the final slides. And um, there is at least one great question in the YouTube comments. Uh, maybe we can quickly answer. Yeah. So I'll just quickly oh, show sorry. You. Yeah, we just have like a fun Q and A slide, so. <laughs> so that's what you wanted to share. <laughs> yeah, that and also this fun one as well. Um, okay. So yeah, we we both really hope that you enjoyed this and that you will go forth and monitor. And and there's a list of resources here, which we um, can also pass on to you, Alexi, uh, to share. Yeah, with everyone. thank you. Do you have time for more than one question? Because I will have an extra one. If, if you have time, yeah, I wanted to be respectful okay. of your time too. Okay. Yeah. So I was wondering how does Grafana store the dashboards? So now you showed how to create um, a dashboard, but how does it like, is it uh, some internal representation? Is it JSON? Can I save it to Git then later so I can just easily reproduce it? Or how, how does it work? Um, yeah, so the dashboards are under the hood saved um, as a JSON, a JSON file. Um, you can also have, you can create, so what I showed right now was a manual um, making use of the UI to create dashboards, but this also means that you're able to create dashboards as code. Um, we actually don't do this at Ecosia yet, but we've talked about the fact that we would like to potentially in the future um yeah i hope that answers your question so then you can store it in git you can easily uh, recover the dashboards if something happens and so correct on. yeah um i do want to share a real life scenario we made a change to the data source um and this kind of broke lots of dashboards and initially you know after the initial panic we remembered oh wait we have a history grafana has a really lovely history that it captures of all the dashboards. Um, so we were able to then just restore um, or also make manual edits to the JSON, which you're able to do directly through the Grafana UI as well. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, another question, I, I'll rephrase it slightly. Um, so my understanding is that the question asks if we can use this, this setup, Prometheus and Grafana for monitoring, for example, electric power usage or uh, 
have alerts on electric use. Like it's not uh, only for metrics, a for um, like Python applications, right? Yeah, this is like my home project for like quite a long time. Is I got some smart plugs, and I'm like, okay, I want to like pull out the statistics from that and then put them into a Grafana dashboard. I think they were also asking um, how you would kind of be able to alert when the electric use is above a certain amount. And um, yeah, I think that's also like a very interesting use case. You need to think about is it if you want to alert if it just absolutely goes above a certain amount. Um, you can with the, uh, the gauge visualization, you can um, set different um, thresholds and it will change color depending on the thresholds. So you could have like an orange threshold of like, nah, it's getting a bit too much and like a red, okay, now it's time to and start saving some electricity. I can totally understand why folks might have this on their mind right now. Um, but yeah, you can also do something uh, where you can query and look back from the last, uh, like for example, seven days or like any time duration, depending on how long you're storing your data for. Um, so you could also maybe say like, oh, I wanna see if over the course of um, the day I'm using the same amount of power as I used last week at this time, uh, for example. So I can think of definitely some fun things you could do with that. Mm -hmm. And if you have some, I don't know, sensors, uh, some IoT data, then you can take this data, put this to uh, to Prometheus, and then visualize all, all that with Grafana. And in what place do we put alerts? Do do they do we put them in Prometheus, or do they do we configure them in Grafana, or both? Or... Um, so you can configure alerts in Grafana, as far as I understand. Um, I've never done this personally. We configure our alerts to be handled um, as code um, by something called Alert Manager. Um, so this essentially makes use of when it's attached to a Prometheus data source, how that functions is that you can say, um, for example, when the total number of requests um exceeds you know this value that you declare you should alert um you should alert us either immediately or like after you can specify a time frame so if this value has been exceeded for like over a few days or a day minutes even um then then it can send you an alert and the way that we do this is that we have um slack alerts that are sent to us um which then either interact with our on-call like alerting system, which will raise like a red flag to alert us um, that something is not as expected. Yep, yeah, thank you. I guess uh, that's all for today. So please uh, send me the slides or they're already, I think they're already in the Git repo, right? So we can they're just in go the to the but they are actually the ones from the uh, workshop that we gave at PyCon and we did slightly edit them um, like Vanessa mentioned to be a little bit more explicit so we can maybe update that and add the, yeah. the latest ones. So then the, the link to the repo is in the description um, and then I guess uh, yeah I would like to thank you for joining us today for doing this workshop that's really great and a lot of students from our courses had questions about Prometheus and Grafana now I know where to send them so this video will definitely answer all the questions and yeah thanks uh, thanks again and thanks everyone for joining us today too and uh, following along the tutorial thank you Alexi and thank you everyone yeah thank you um, have a great rest of your day.